good morning. Uh, it's Mike Head again from Ethical Screening. And this morning, I'm talking to Seb Bellow from Web. If you can do a brief web thing, Seb, you can even tell us what web stands for because we've been trying to work it out. So, yes, good morning. Uh, very nice to be here. Talking to you, Mike. Um, so, I'm Seb Bellow. I'm a partner and head of research at Web Asset Management. Um, and Yes, let's deal with the acronym. WEB stands for Wiley Hayworth Environment Business. Uh, Rob Wiley and Kim Hayworth were the two founders way back when. And the, I guess the, the thing that's most interesting about that is that we've always been focused on sustainability or, or the environment, as it was originally called back in uh, the late 1990s when, uh, when Rob and Kim set up WEB. But we've always been focused on sustainability, and, and we still are. Um, today in 2023. So you exclusively manage money within this space. You don't have there. There is one uh, area that you operate in. You don't have the the bit that is is obviously necessary if you're a big asset manager. You can't be exclusively a sustainability manager. But there's also that fact that you don't have to think about other issues. It is exclusively the the one theme that runs through the firm. That's right. Yeah. I mean, uh, so myself and my two partners, uh, George Latham and Ted Franks, we all used to work in, you know, uh, different uh, larger asset managers and all wanted to come to web because we were, we are passionate about sustainability and we want to focus, we're not interested in running money in any other way. So that's why, um, uh, that's why we came to web and that will, that's what we do. And that's what we will always do. We'll always be focused on sustainability alone, you know, as part of the investment process, obviously we're running money to make returns for our clients, but we only want to run that in a way that is consistent with sustainability. So you launched, because you do an annual report. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, you have different themes that run through them, but can you, can you explain the, the, the reason and, and, why it matters and what it shows about the sort of the soul of web in a way. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you. We um, yeah we launched our impact report um, last week, and um, uh, it's for us it's a, a, an opportunity really I guess to uh, present all the work that we do in one place um, uh, around the impact and the, the, the impact that we were having uh, both through the investments that we make and through our own activities as well as web um so it is it's a it's a kind of um you know set piece uh this is this is the complete package if you like and you can you know obviously you can go onto the website and find out little bits about us but this is kind of the the, the sort of uh the, the complete sort of holistic uh story of web um i think it matters because you know it's so important that we're transparent about what we do and i have to say it's a, it's a it's a frustration of mine that the industry as a whole isn't much more transparent i do think it's kind of outrageous and i'm surprised people aren't more outraged that they often can only know the top 10 holdings in their in their fund um you know for us we want our investors to be excited about every investment that we make and so we are very transparent about all the investments that we make in the strategy. And we think on principle, our investors are entitled to know where their money's invested. So that's the kind of core of it is around being transparent and hope and hopefully um, uh, by being transparent, our investors can be excited about where their money is invested and the kinds of impacts that it's able to have. Um, and the, and the report is really a chance for us to really lay that all out and hopefully connect with our investors around what it is that we're doing and, and why. Has there been a change, you think, in investor expectation over the time that Web have been running money? Oh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's always a, there's a spectrum of, of, of interest and kind of uh, knowledge. Um, one of the things that, that we um, definitely feel is that the, the requirement to demonstrate uh, and um, uh, provide data to support what you're claiming is you know, massively different to where it was 10 years ago. Back then, you know, if you were a sustainable fund, 
it kind of it was almost implicit that you would be serious because why would you be doing it unless you were serious? It wasn't popular. It was a bit of a weird little niche of the industry. Surely you'd only do that if you were serious about it, which is probably true. And then 10 years later, of course, it's become much more popular uh, and a whole range of different actors have launched strategies called themselves sustainable um, with honestly varying degrees of authenticity. And I think if you want to be able to claim legitimacy, you need to lay it all out. You have to show exactly why you invest in the way you do in the companies that you own. So I think that's changed dramatically in terms of uh, you know, the last few years. And I think that's a very healthy thing as well. Uh, the, the top tens thing I find really interesting because um, I think people are going to, we know there's this going on with labeling and, and, and greenwash and everything, but in a way that the asset managers shoot themselves in the foot because um, the top 10 holdings in a big uh, sort of global sustainable fund tend to be quite uninteresting. Um, right. I looked at one recently, not bad companies by any means, yeah. but not the sort of company that's going to make someone think, oh, yay, I'm glad my money's there. Yeah. Because looking at one as I did last week, and you've got Microsoft and Alphabet and Visa and MasterCard and stuff like that, no one's going to look at that and think, ooh, they're going to change the planet. I understand how they are necessary. And there's a, there's, it, with some of those, there's a best and better message than people ever uh, will know unless they, they look deeply into it. But if you looked at the bottom 10, you'd actually find the small, because if you are a big asset manager and you've got a five billion pound fund, you know, you, you do have to be careful about creating distortion in the market. Mm. But why would they not be putting that front and center rather than just, here's the top 10, that's enough for you to know? Yes, I, I mean, I, to be honest, I think a lot of it is just uh, sort of uh, cultural almost. It's the way it's always been, so it's the way it's done. But um, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, we like to think that we can we can flip it on its head and make people excited about what we own, rather than feeling like it's you know you're you're giving some important information away. We, we want to give that information away because we think people will be excited about it. It's something I repeatedly say, which is I think, and clearly you're demonstrating it. Managers need to be more proud of the companies that they're investing into, because you've done it to make financial gain. Let's let's not pretend that we're just doing this because we want to buy nice companies. Mm. But having put all that effort in to then just stick it on a dusty shelf and not really even allude to it just yeah. seems particularly peculiar. I think the the push to unexpected holdings is going to be interesting because obviously we're hoping that that's what the regulator is going to bring in with labels because. That's what people deserve to know. What we're not sure about is how they're going to define what is unexpected, because something's unexpected to everybody. You know, yeah. someone, someone who's bothered about certain issues is going to look at your fund and think, oh, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I'd rather not have biotech. But then they know and they can make yeah. an informed decision. And well, also you can, you can make the case for why you have that biotech company in there and they can, they can make a, a, a balanced view. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I think, um, and the, um, the whole thing about, you know, we talk about impact investing now, and we never used to talk about that, we used to talk about sustainability, but with impact investing, you know, part of the, the requirement, really, or the expectation, perhaps, at this stage, rather than a requirement, is that you really have to lay out the logic of, you know, what is the problem that you're trying to tackle, and how does this, how does this company solve that problem, and, you know, kind of show people that logic. And um, there are companies in our portfolio that, that I expect some people will find, um, you know, obviously we don't own anything deeply controversial. We're not in oil and gas or anything because we don't consider them to be providing a solution. But we own a, a company called Linda, for example, uh, L-I-N-D-E, which is a large um, industrial gases company. Um, and, uh, you know, for some people, that's quite a controversial Quite a controversial stock because it's a sort of chemical industry and they use a lot of energy to produce oxygen and hydrogen is another uh, important uh, gas that they produce. Um, and we, but we explain what you know the the, the, the gases that they supply. Um, a lot of it goes into health applications. A lot of it goes into making things like steel making more efficient. So there is a logic. There's clearly a logic as to why we think this business fits for us. And people might disagree, but at least we're being transparent about it and we can have a conversation about it like you say rather than trying to keep it hidden um i think that's the thing because the expectation that all you're going to have is wind farms solar parks is is all very well but there have to be there has to be 
obviously diversification because otherwise <laughs> it's quite a quite a volatile world to invest into but um, I always find it interesting clients find that bit more interesting quite often than they do the financial side of it because they they expect there's two things they expect firstly that you won't invest into a, an arms company or a tobacco company and secondly that you're going to try and make them money mm. because that does seem like that's part of the deal mm. absolutely I mean I think this is why it's only why I'm so passionate about this area is because I, it just is a win, it just feels like a win-win. You know, you're investing in companies. The world needs more solutions to these challenges, uh, whether it's climate change or you know clean water or clean air or um, you know more healthcare, whatever it is. We need companies that are providing innovative products that help solve these challenges. Uh, and because the world needs more of them, in principle at least. They should see revenue growth. They need. To, they could sell more of their products and services. Now, of course, that's a bit simplistic. There's all sorts of things that can get between that relationship. But as a way of investing, it makes a lot of sense. These are the industries of the future, as we used to call the strategy when we were at a previous company. Um, <laughs> and this is, <laughs> but and, and this is where we want to invest. You know, what, what's not to like? They're having a positive impact. They're growing you know they're, they're making money and that can come back to us as shareholders do you because greenwashing has been um something that uh was an accusation previously that was uh, pretty much uh, around companies rather than around funds and then i think it's been changed over the last few years and obviously mm -hmm. the regulators now uh, realize that those people who are changing labels on funds but not changing much about the fund it's perhaps something they should be concerned about mm. do you ever get questions about greenwash and are you in it seems unlikely but doesn't it's not impossible um i don't think we've ever been accused of greenwash um you know i think uh because we're very transparent people can see what we invest in we certainly get questions about individual holdings i mean i mentioned linda uh you know there are other companies that people are confused why do you hold that and we have to explain why and generally when we've explained why then they okay that makes sense um so that's yeah we've never really been accused of greenwash uh, but um like you say uh, and it's not something that i've actually thought about before you're right it has moved from being, I mean, I think there's still allegations around greenwash at company level, clearly. Uh, and, um, you know, companies increasingly have a, an incentive to uh, try and position themselves as greener than they are, including to us as investors. Uh, there's definitely a premium that they think they can get if they can position themselves as a green company. So, well, you know, one of the things that we have to have as investors is skepticism uh healthy skepticism um and, and a knowledge around what is actually going on so you know uh oil and gas companies bp shell you know particularly now um have often claimed that they are you know greening shall we say um but in practice it's still a tiny part of what they do um so you know that's a relatively easy bit of greenwash to see through but there's 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 still a lot of it around and, and i think part of our job is to is to see through that and see what which ones are real and which ones are sort of you know um, making more of what's actually going on than it's actually the, the truth i think it's the it's the danger of marketing departments getting excited about a niche of the market that they want to get into and not making yeah. sure making sure that the product fits and uh yeah. and that's obviously the bit that's caused the regulator to sit up and think hang on a minute if you've gone from a fund with 240 holdings and now you've got the same fund with the same holdings and you've stuck an esg label on it people are going to expect it to be different to the one it was before and seemingly some are and some aren't yeah but in a way it's you know i kind of see this as a uh, you know as a mark of progress really i mean you certainly need to uh develop a regulatory system that prevents greenwash, but the fact that people see value in it, I mean, I, you know, again, going back 10 years, you were saying earlier how you, you and I have been around quite a long time, and certainly oh, yeah. I, can, I can remember a time when no one was remotely interested in, I mean, there was a, a very, you know, a, um, a group of clients who we are, you know, devoted to because they, 
you know, they, they were responsible for the start of this industry. Um, but the fact that there's more people that are interested and that it, it, there's value that people that asset managers want to attract uh, is, is progress. We just need to now make sure that we have a regulatory system that kind of requires that to be real, you know, that the underlying change is there. I think that's a good point on which to finish. Thank you very much. That's been jolly interesting. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you.